Colchester is known to be the oldest recorded town in England, known for its beautiful countryside and creative architecture, filled with history and abundant with lush greenery. There are parks everywhere, where people would go to walk their dogs, play with their children, fly a kite, and for some, hide the bodies. On the 29th of March, 2014, the body of a 33-year-old man was found and reported to the police at 5.45 a.m. Jim Atfield was in the grass at Castle Park, completely covered in blood. He had been stabbed 102 times. The majority of the stabs focused on his face, specifically his eyes. At the time he was found, Jim was still alive, barely clinging to life. But unfortunately, 45 minutes after, he would pass away. There are 102 separate wounds on the body, which are believed to have been caused by a knife. This was a violent, frenzied attack on a vulnerable young man. At the moment, we haven't established uh, who's responsible or a motive for this attack. We also haven't recovered any weapon. However, I'd ask those who live in the, the local area if someone came home, a partner or son or daughter, and had blood on their clothing, or came home with injuries they didn't go out with, or perhaps you've looked at your knife block and there's a knife missing, I would urge you to contact police so that we can follow up the information. Jim had already gone through hardships in his life before this. In 2010, he survived a car accident that left him with brain damage resulting in limited mobility and speech. Um, well, I had a coma and I was in the right red way, apparently. My mind works all right, but my body sometimes does me down. Somebody will see you, you've got a disability and think, oh, you must be stupid. Although things would be more difficult for Jim after the accident, he didn't let that stop him from doing his best, along with the help of his family, to progress and to be a good father to his four children. Before the accident, Jim was a fun-loving guy who was generally happy. He grew up in Colchester and was proud to call it his home. He had no reasons to ever feel unsafe or in danger in his town. Although the accident changed his life drastically, he was grateful to be alive and accepted the dramatic changes he would have to make within his life. As a part of his recovery, he was living in semi-sheltered accommodations. One night, Jim decided to go out for a few drinks and walked over to a local bar. It was a short walk and probably something that Jim had done many times before. Once he had his fill, he gathered his things and he headed back home. Castle Park was a shortcut for many people in the area because you could just cut through and enjoy the greenery of the park instead of walking up and down the city streets. Apparently, Jim had had a little bit too much to drink while he was at the bar, because a witness remembers seeing Jim sitting in the grass at the park at about 1 a.m. The passerby went up to Jim to check on him. Jim said that he was okay, and the witness could tell that Jim was drunk, but he was just sitting in the grass not hurting anyone. So when this witness saw that Jim was all right, he decided to continue his walk, but not before telling Jim to be careful. Jim wasn't seen again until 5.45 that morning after he had been attacked. Video surveillance shows numerous people who had walked through the park that night. And for the police, any one of them could be the murderer, someone who was walking through the park and happened to come across Jim who had dozed off in the grass. Jim was covered in defensive wounds, which proved that he had tried to fight off his murderer, but the fact that he was vulnerable and maybe even asleep when the attack started left him unable to protect himself during the ambush. Since this was a fairly safe and small place to live, the community of Colchester was living in fear. To his friends and family's knowledge, Jim didn't have any enemies. He didn't owe anyone money, and frankly, after his accident, he tended to keep to himself most of the time, which for this town was terrifying, because if it wasn't a personal attack, that meant that there was someone out there randomly attacking people just for the thrill of it. 
meaning that no one was safe and everyone was a potential victim. Yes, since James' accident in 2010, he's very fragile and would have easily been knocked over, which makes this attack even more macabre. The person who carried it out would have definitely been covered in blood and they definitely had a weapon. We're very keen to locate that weapon and if anybody saw somebody on the Saturday morning with blood on them, we would be keen to hear from them. We should remind people 102 stab wounds. The police and news put a lot of time and effort into finding this attacker and letting the community know what was happening so that they could keep themselves safe. But slowly, as time went by and no answers were found, Jim's tragic story and the hunt for his killer ran cold. But it would soon thaw out when three months later, the attacker struck again. Nahid Almania was 31 years old. She was a university student from Saudi Arabia who was working on her PhD at the University of Essex. Just six months earlier, she had moved to Colchester with her brother, who was also a student at the university. She and her brother walked to their university together quite literally every single time, except for once. On this day, Nahid would be found in a field covered in stab wounds. A man and his friend went out looking for his cat who had just run out of his home. And while they were walking through the field calling out for his cat, they came across Nahid's body. The scene was similar to that of Jim Matfield's, except that Nahid had far fewer stab wounds, but her stab wounds would be much deeper and more purposeful. The attacker was getting more comfortable. And again, the majority of the stab wounds were on her face, targeting her eyes. Her skull was fractured from the force and her eyes were out of their sockets. She has been murdered in a way that can only be termed a brutal and savage attack. Are you investigating the possibility that there could be a serial killer on the lease in Colchester? There are some obvious similarities between her death and that of James Atfield, who was stabbed to death in Colchester on March the 29th of this year. And this is a possibility that is being explored. Again, no evidence was left behind. The only thing the police had to work off of was a witness who claimed to have seen a young man wearing an Italian-looking jacket in that area. So they worked with what they had. Of the Salary Brook trial. He was seen on Tuesday morning around about 10.20, between 10.20 and 10.40 a.m. And he was wearing what can only be described as a distinctive jacket. The male is described as being in his late teens to 30 years of age. He had thick, dark hair which is described as mop-like on top, perhaps two to three inches tall. He was quite short, sorry, he was clean-shaven, of average build and of tanned appearance, not wearing any glasses. And so it started again. The police scoured the town for more clues and news outlets alerted citizens of Colchester to stay safe and keep an eye out for any suspicious behavior that might fit the limited description of this killer. There was more police activity in Colchester at this time than there had ever been before. Well, only a few weeks after our appeal, Saudi Arabian student Nahid Almania was also murdered in Colchester. The 31-year-old's body was found a mere two miles from where James was killed. Nahid had been on her way to a lecture at the University of Essex when she was stabbed 16 times and somehow think that they are linked. What would you say to that? We hadn't ruled out that possibility, but there's no definitive evidence linking the two murders. They remain separate investigations, but run in parallel. Crime Stoppers had even set up a £20,000 reward, roughly $25,000, for whoever would call in with information that would eventually lead to the arrest. Multiple men were brought in and interrogated, but none could be tied to the murders and were eventually released. The town had no answers at all. They didn't know whether they were being preyed upon by a possible serial killer or whether they happened to have two separate killers and could look at anyone as a suspect. And that's how it went for months. Actually, an entire year went by with no answers. It wasn't until May of 2015 when a woman named Michelle was out walking her dog when she saw someone wearing an Italian jacket. And normally you'd think a jacket, that isn't enough. But when that's literally all there is to work with, she went with it. She remembered the news about the Italian jacket and decided to pay extra attention to this man. 
This also happened to be the same area that Nahid was found in and right around the same time of year. This young man was standing on a bridge and after watching him for some time, Michelle felt that he was acting a little suspicious. She was definitely uncomfortable and was in no way going to go in his direction. She came to the conclusion that he was acting strange enough that she would call the police. But the moment the police arrived, he was gone. The police didn't see him on the bridge anymore and thought, well, I guess we missed him. We'll get him next time. And they were ready to head out until Michelle pointed out that he was literally just there, hiding in the bushes. She could see him. And I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that maybe they were also thinking, we've just got a call from a woman that said that there's a man in a jacket, giving off some creep vibes. Nothing really solid to go off of, and they possibly weren't taking the report too seriously because she hasn't necessarily called in a crime. It was just a feeling. Obviously, I got close enough, so when he looked at me, I looked back at him, I felt really, really sort of scared, panicked. I turned around, went back on where I was, um, and that's when I obviously decided I needed to call the police, but I wasn't 100% certain, because I thought, you know, if he hasn't done anything, do I or don't I? And you could have been just seconds away from... Yeah, yeah. If I'd have gone in five minutes later, which is what I already knew, where he was in that bush, I, I know that he'd have got me from behind, and I know that, and... Um, yeah, that's the most horrific part, you know. But thank goodness that Michelle went with those feelings and didn't let the police write her off too quickly. Actually, thank goodness that she went with her intuition and called the police at all, because she very well could have been the next victim if she had continued on with her walk. Once the police had lured this young man out of the bushes, they noticed that he was indeed holding a knife and wearing gloves. Because of this, they are able to arrest him and take him to the police station to be questioned. They arrested 15-year-old James Fairweather. Many believe that one of the most shocking revelations was that he was only 15. The fact that police were looking for a grown adult could have been why he wasn't caught sooner. Now at this moment, they have him in custody for hiding in the bushes with a knife. What they would have to do next is figure out how to connect him to the murders of Jim Atfield and Nahid Almania, which turned out to be much easier than they thought, because the moment they put James into the interrogation room, he spilled everything. He immediately confessed to the murders and started describing them in detail. No, I saw him. It was, where, it was lying on the grass. Like, like that. It was like, like that. Just, just fast asleep, where he was drunk. And he goes, he goes, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. Do it, do it. So I went up to him. Can I stand up? No. Yes. Went up to him. Stood over like that. I'm that. So I stabbed him first there. And I've done it a few times. If you're thinking, this kid is pure evil. For him to commit such horrific acts, to brutally kill helpless and innocent people, he must be deeply disturbed. But according to James... He's not. This wasn't his choice. He is a victim just as much as the others because the voices in his head are forcing him to commit these acts. He has no choice. The voices were talking to me. You need to make a sacrifice or we're going to come and get you. You need to do it. And I saw him. Then he goes, he goes, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. Do it, do it. While I was doing that, my voices were laughing and laughing and laughing louder and louder. Growing up, James was quiet and well-behaved. In fact, teachers and his peers said that he was caring and helped others out when he could. People spoke well of him. He had a good relationship with his family and there weren't ever any signs of neglect at home. Once he grew into his teen years, he started to get bullied a bit by other teens at school. Apparently, his ears were the hot topic and he was constantly made fun of for them. That, along with the loss of his grandmother, are accredited to being the reason that James started escalating into a darker, moodier version of himself. But truth be told, he didn't really go through anything that many other teenagers haven't gone through. I in no way condone bullying in the slightest. But people do go through these situations and don't come out of it with the fixation for violence. James started telling teachers and other students that he wanted to be a killer when he grew up. He wanted everyone to know that he was dangerous, and all of his free time was used researching serial killers and their stories. This should have been a sign. 
James claims to have been mugged at knife point by other teens and that the knife in that moment, instead of scaring him, made him feel empowered. So he then went out and got a knife for himself and then robbed a small shop. The rush that he felt from that was so strong that he became obsessed with replicating that feeling. Also, that 20,000 pound reward for catching the killer? Well, Michelle didn't receive it because she made the mistake of calling the police before calling Crime Stoppers. I'm sure that either way, she's happy that she didn't become James's next victim and that she got a murderer off of the streets. But it's pretty clear that she was a crucial part to finding him. And without her, who knows how long before James would have been arrested. They went to trial 11 months later and the defense focused on convincing everyone that he was not mentally stable and could not be held responsible. And since he could not be held responsible, he could not be at fault for the murders, even though he was the one who physically committed them. They ran with the idea that James was hearing voices in his head and that he had psychotic tendencies at the time of the murders. Many professionals were brought in, and three actually agreed with the diagnosis that James was suffering from psychosis. But the prosecution psychiatrist believed that he was lying, because James made efforts to cover up the murders by wearing gloves, throwing away his clothing, and tossing the murder weapons into a fast-running river. This shows that he was lucid enough to know that what he was doing was wrong and that he wasn't in a state of psychosis during the murders. Along with that, there was a deep internet search which revealed very disturbing websites about other murderers and violent crimes. There were also searches asking how to reduce court sentences and how to get away with murder, but there were never any searches found that included mental health, as in, am I psychotic? I'm hearing voices. Is this normal? Which is odd, because if you just started hearing voices one day, especially voices that are telling you to kill, you would think that this would be a concern that you would research, or at least question. Investigators even found a scrapbook that James had made of newspaper clippings talking about the murders and the fear that the community was feeling because of him. Surely the voices didn't force him to do that. This evidence was used to suggest that James was lying about hearing voices, and the thoughts of murder were his own. On April 22nd of 2016, the jury came back unanimously with a guilty verdict of double murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 27 years in prison. Jim Atfield and Nahid Almania should have been able to walk through the parks of their town without fear of being attacked and murdered. They had already overcome and accomplished so much. Our hearts go out to their families and loved ones. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe to show your support, and we'll see you in the next one.